think it's a certainty that Joe Biden will be inaugurated as president in January, uh, based on what you know at this moment in time? Yeah, I think I think it's looking that way, isn't it? We're recording this on the Thursday afternoon. Uh, the election was a couple of days ago. It certainly looks that way. Who knows? I think there will be a big and ugly fight over it, uh, which I think will end with Joe Biden being inaugurated. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's the election special. It's also the lockdown special. First day of lockdown here in the UK. So lots of things to talk about on both of those fronts. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I'm very keen to hear what you've got to say about lockdown as somebody who feels that we definitely need to be discussing it more. Mm. A lot of people that I know are just totally unengaged. They're just sort of like, oh, yeah, lockdown is coming up. It's good. Looking yeah. forward to it, uh, which I just find bizarre. Um, either you should be very concerned about the situation from a health point of view, as in, God, the situation with the NHS, et cetera, is so bad that we've got to lock down. And so therefore you'd be pretty worried. Or you think that, you know, lockdown is worse than, you know, the or you, you think lockdown is unnecessary or you think that, you know, the impact of lockdown is worse than the impact of coronavirus, in which case you'd be pretty annoyed. But I just see, I don't know whether you've experienced indifference uh, to this or, you know, lack of engagement. I guess perhaps you wouldn't because of what you do in the trigonometry um, mm. podcast. Have but you... anyway, I think I sidetracked you. We can stick with the US election for a bit, if you like. Well, that, that's that's very true. Um, we have been sidetracked somewhat, but, uh, you know, I'm keen to just explore this avenue for a while and we, we can revert. Yeah. We can revert. Have you experienced any indifference on, on, on this lockdown? Yeah, I think most people feel strongly one way or another. Uh, the interesting thing linking this to the election in the United States, obviously, whether you were a Biden or a Trump supporter, the one thing's very clear, uh, the people who've done the worst out of this are the pollsters again. Uh, and it's interesting in this country because the pollsters are the very people who are telling us lockdown is immensely popular with the public. So it, it puts into my mind certainly a question mark over that for a start, uh, we're told that up to 70% of people support a second lockdown, up to 40% apparently want a harder lockdown, a harder, deeper, faster, and, and whatever else it might be. Um, so I, I start to question some of that, first of all. Uh, my own view is, uh, is based on the government's own projections. According to the government's own figures, and this has been reported in a number of newspapers, the lockdown we had in March, which lasted only two or three months, uh, that killed will kill uh, in the next few years up to 200,000 people uh, due to missed cancer diagnosis, missed heart, uh, heart disease treatments, etc. So the delays in treatment will end up killing up to 200,000 people. We, in addition to, you know, that includes suicides that have spiked, depression, uh, domestic violence, all of these other things. Uh, that are obviously rising as well. Uh, so based on that, and based on the fact that we've just locked down again, this lockdown will not last until December. That's nonsense. This lockdown will continue all the way through to March. So it will be longer than the last one. Uh, and therefore, I imagine, given that it's winter as well, uh, less good weather, less opportunity to go outside and maintain your mental health and so on, uh, we're likely to end up with a bigger uh, impact on, on the death toll from lockdown as a result of this uh, second lockdown as well. So I am at the point where I'm starting very much to question what's happening, even though I supported the first lockdown, I thought that in a situation where you don't know what's happening, an overreaction can be the right reaction. I supported it then. I think in those circumstances, it was the right thing to do. On reflection, of course, I think it's, it's been shown that the lockdown was unnecessary, the infection rate and the death rate both started to go down before the lockdown was introduced. Um, and so uh, certainly I, do, I don't think once you've realized something was an overreaction, overreacting again is not the right reaction, particularly given that, again, we now know, and this is no conspiracy theory, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but the figures that Boris Johnson and his team used to justify locking us down a second time, uh, those figures are actually, uh, they were debunked the very next day on the pure maths of it. Uh, the fact they claimed up to 4,000 people a day may end up dying. Uh, and according to that very model, 1,000 people a day would have been dying on the Sunday uh, immediately after the announcement. And only 200 people uh, had, had 
died that day. Uh, and it turns out they used figures which were three weeks out of date when up-to-date figures were available and were nowhere near as scary as the ones they used. So there's something fishy going on. Uh, I, I have my thoughts on that. Uh, but uh, it increasingly, wherever you look at any of the government's response to uh, COVID-19, it doesn't seem to make any sense. Yeah, I think that's a very compelling argument that you're making. And it's one that I've heard before um, a lot that, that those figures were debunked. Um, I mean, isn't it also the case that the figures, the projections um, presented by the government weren't actually projections, they were they were scenarios? Mm. Um, yeah, th there's lots of that sort of thing going on. And I think the question that you really have to ask yourself is, uh, why would a government do something like that, knowing that they're killing people? And the thing is, what they're doing really is, it's not a choice between saving lives and not saving lives, which is what we've been presented with. It's a choice between killing, essentially causing the deaths of uh, elderly people who are not protected sufficiently for COVID-19 uh, and leading to deaths from cancer and other heart disease and other things in much younger and otherwise much healthier people who have a much longer life ahead of them. So essentially you're saving a few months of granny quite possibly in a care home, quite possibly suffering from dementia or bedridden in exchange for a father of three in his 40s. And that is a calculation that doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Uh, the politics of it, I think, is what's driving it. I don't think it's any massive conspiracy. There is a lot of conspiracy flying about because that's what happens when what is being done doesn't make sense. People start to think of ways. But I just see it as a pure political thing. Everyone who dies now from covid particularly if there were no were to be no lockdown gets added to boris johnson's personal tally you know this is the number of people boris johnson personally strangled to death with covid uh on the other hand if someone dies three years from now from cancer well they don't get added to his personal tally so it seems to me like a lot of people are trying to protect their reputation there will of course be a public inquiry into all of this in the years to come and people are thinking more about that than about saving lives yeah, I think that's really bad, the way that some people have reported it in the manner of under Boris Johnson's watch, this mm -hmm. amount of people died. And indeed, I actually had somebody on the podcast who suggested that Donald Trump was responsible for all 200,000 deaths in America, 200,000 plus deaths. Mm -hmm. um, the, the exact words were, I think every single one of those deaths is his fault. And I, I did say, you know, that is the harshest criticism I've ever heard. And I've heard a lot of harsh criticism about his handling, but that is, you know, that is the harshest. I mean, to blame somebody for every single death, every single one from a pandemic is pretty ridiculous, I think. I mean, and I, I also struggle to see in the US, you know, Trump's handling of it has been panned. Um, no one's given a great answer to what more he could have done. Hmm. Well, I, I imagine there would have been things he could have done. I imagine there would be lots of things that Boris Johnson could have done. I imagine there would be lots of things that every single leader in the world could have done uh, because yeah. this was a new threat. We're not used to dealing with it in hindsight, but probably, you know, if you, you could argue that somebody else would have done something else, but maybe not done something else, you know, that you, we will never know. Uh, I think it's, it's widely uh, believed that Donald Trump has not handled it very well. And maybe, the handling of it is more in the PR part of it than the actual decisions yeah. part of it. Uh, the way that he talked about it may be more, more the issue. Um, and obviously that perception has clearly had an impact on the election. I think COVID uh, is what killed his re-election uh, campaign. Uh, the economy uh, going uh, down the toilet with lockdowns, with the downturn resulting from coronavirus uh, is probably what uh, did him in. Um, and it's obviously had a huge impact uh, in this country as well. Yeah, certainly. And perhaps we haven't actually seen anything like the full impact of it on people's jobs, on their livelihoods yet. Do you think that there's likely to be more second guessing of why we're locking down society when this impact hits? Because, I mean, the furlough scheme's still going on at the moment, isn't it? Well, the first scheme has just now been extended until March, which tells you that my prediction that the, the lockdown won't last for one month only is probably quite accurate. They might lift it for a few days over Christmas because it's a family-friendly virus that wants us to get together. I don't know, whatever their rationale will be. They'll make up some 
bullshit excuse. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, the, the furlough scheme continues. And as long as it continues, you can keep people uh, sort of pacified uh, enough, because obviously, if, if you weren't paying people to stay at home, then, uh, then there would be, I think, pandemonium. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think the, the, lock, the impact of the lockdown will be huge. We're likely to face the greatest recession for centuries. Uh, and that will have a huge impact, not only on the economy. And, you know, a lot of people seem to think that the economy is sort of this thing that Rishi Sunak keeps under his desk. It's not really like that. The economy is ordinary people not having a job to come back to. Ordinary people's businesses that they've worked for years to build up uh, and, and create going bust. It, it's people uh, losing their homes. It's people being unemployed. It's people killing themselves because they don't see a future for themselves. The economy uh, and the economic downturns, and this is historically uh, well established, economic depressions kill lots and lots of people. Uh, and so I come back to my point earlier. This is not about saving lives versus not saving lives. This is about different ways of killing people. And, you know, we're going down a very particular route. Yeah. And I'm surprised that there's been less dis discussion of the impact of this disease, um, you know, or the, rather the impact of lockdowns mm. um, on mainstream media. I, I don't ever really see any reports of the impact it's had on people's livelihoods on. I haven't seen actually a single news report on any of the businesses that have been destroyed. I mean, mm. people who have worked and made huge sacrifices to set up businesses are having to close them down. This is wrecking people's lives and there's there's been no coverage of it. I mean, in the same way that you'd cover the impact of the virus on people's health, surely we should be covering all these other disasters. I mean, it's not it's not happy reporting, it's not uplifting news, but I thought the role of journalists was to just tell us what's going on? Well, uh, there are some notable exceptions. Uh, talk radio have been pretty uh, pretty uh, hardcore anti-lockdown. Uh, there's been a, a number of articles in the Telegraph about this as well, exposing some of the bogus numbers the government were putting out. So uh, there are some in the mainstream media who, who are doing their job. Uh, but you're right, if you, if you read BBC News uh, and, and The Guardian, uh, you're not likely to see much uh, uh, about the, the dangers of the lockdown and the impact of the lockdown. Indeed, uh, you will see any attempts to discuss that discredited in those, in those sources. But, you know, th that, that's, that's the mainstream media. This is an unfortunate thing that's happened in the last, particularly in the last four years, is I think Brexit, Trump, uh, and the, the, everything that's been happening over the last four years has sort of broken journalism to a point where, um, you know, it's just naked agenda driven journalism. Now there is no attempt with, with notable exceptions. And I make this point, the notable exceptions to this, but the bulk of the mainstream media are no longer reporting what's happening. They're now just agenda driven partisans. Uh, and, and it seems that in those particular institutions, the, the pro lockdown agenda is very strong. Uh, and so that's that's why you're not seeing it uh, when you're you're picking up your copy of the Guardian or reading BBC News or CNN or whatever else it might be. Why is that? Why are they pushing lockdown so much? There was a bizarre tendency when I was watching the U.S. election coverage of reporters who were out in the field reporting the election for very high-profile media outlets, you know, ABC News and CNN, etc. And you, you know, they probably would have been tested fairly recently if they're going all over the place, um, standing miles away from anyone, um, and you know, they were the sort of correspondent in certain states um, mm. doing their bit on the show, miles away from anyone. On you know, national television, they've got a mask over their face. Yeah, um, it's actually affecting uh, how clearly one can hear them. You can't see their facial expressions totally pointless for them to be wearing the mask. It seems to be a sort of, you know, like putting on a poppy, like, oh, I'm supporting coronavirus. I don't want to kill my grandma. I'm wearing a mask totally unnecessarily. I get wearing masks when it's needed. Sure. I'm happy to do it. I'm not going to go mental and rip masks off people's faces like you've seen in some American supermarkets. But at the same time, is there a tendency 
to sort of support lockdown in this dogmatic way just because it kind of makes you look good and makes you look morally superior? Maybe. I think a lot of people, I've always said this, I didn't never blame people for not necessarily understanding the nuances of everything because people are busy. People have got lives to live there to trying to put food on the table in very difficult circumstances. But the truth is, I think not many, many people have had the opportunity to educate themselves about the facts around lockdown. And so in many people's minds, there is this idea that uh, to support lockdown is to save lives and to oppose lockdown is to want to destroy lives. And so that's why I think a lot of that comes from. And of course, the sort of stupid signaling that you were talking about with journalists, you know, again, it, it, it speaks to a bigger movement in the mainstream media where they seem to think that people are idiots and therefore if a journalist is not seen to be wearing a mask while he's not within 100 miles of anybody nonetheless ordinary people out there will take that as a cue not to wear a mask or something like that and i think that's one of the biggest downfalls of the mainstream media in recent years is the sort of they've made a conscious decision to think that the public are idiots that they wouldn't be interested in in having uh access to an hour long conversation like the one that you and I are having now, or the conversations and interviews that we have on trigonometry with interesting guests, they, they've gone down the here's your two second soundbite uh, route. Uh, and I think that that's detrimental to to our public discourse is detrimental to society and it's having a very negative impact uh, on people's perception of the media, uh, more than anything. I, I do think that what you're saying is true and that long form media is on the rise and it's clear that there is an appetite for discussing these things in depth. But of course, the rise of social media has made a lot of attention spans a lot shorter. Um, and it, it's also kind of led to people being engaged on a very surface level basis, um, sort of saying that they're voting for somebody and why, but without having spent much time looking into everything. Um, do you think that this is having a noticeable effect on um, politics and on you know, society? Yeah, I think I've said this in the past online and people tend to balk at this idea, but really, in my view, the biggest issue of 2020 is not coronavirus, it's not even the presidential election in the United States. It's the big tech influence on our lives and how they have shown themselves now uh, to be completely uh, unneutral and very, very heavily biased in favor of a very particular agenda uh, in terms of shutting down the sharing of stories about certain political candidates in terms of censoring people for having the wrong opinion. Uh, and given that we now live in a world in which and those of us who live in the sort of Western world, we're very much plugged into the online space and we get the vast majority of our information. Uh, you know, with millennials, for example, uh, the statistics show that they get overwhelmingly, they get their news from social media. So they will go on social media and then from there click on very specific articles, etc. So if, if four people in the world or four companies in the world control essentially all the sorts of sources of information in the world, that means it doesn't really matter who's president of the United States. Because if you control what information is and isn't available, you can set the agenda of the country irrespective of who's president. Uh, and, and the big tech media have come out uh, and just they, they've gone for it. They've doubled down on that. Uh, we've seen in the last few days. Uh, I mean, one of the things we talked about on a live stream a few nights ago where Donald Trump tweeted an opinion. So he didn't tweet something about something that had happened that was incorrect. But he said that uh, allowing uh, postal ballots will lead to fraud, right? And that tweet was uh, hidden under some kind of warning that it's factually incorrect. Well, you can't, you can't know the future. Twitter cannot know whether postal ballots lead to fraud or not. That's something that has to be tested in reality when it bails out. It's the same way as me saying, you know, I support Everton, Everton will, will win the league. Well, it's not very likely, right? But you can't fact check that. That isn't something that you fact check. So essentially the, the, the big tech companies are now censoring people's opinions about the future because they understand that expressing an opinion influences other people and how they behave. So they're trying to shape 
the direction in which the information that we receive is going. And to me, that is the biggest story of the future, because essentially, if we all live in an informational space that is controlled by people, they're going to decide what happens and we're going to have very little say over it. Yeah, it's, it's extremely worrying. And actually, I, I think that all these things are very much linked and linked in a very worrying way. Uh, and that's why, you know, I was kind of happy to just get sidetracked into lockdown. I think big tech lockdown and the Biden Trump fight are all inextricably linked. I mean, I know we're thousands of miles away from from the US, but it feels like our societies uh, go hand in hand with each other. And, and, and it's the fact that we're all locked down at home. And so we're spending more time than ever <laughs> looking at our computers looking at our phones i mean i literally felt like i haven't had a drink for three years i'm i'm now teetotal but i lit i felt hung over just from having just looked at screens for so long we have nothing else to do we're all trapped here so big tech have a hold over us more than ever and and therefore their ability to censor things we don't have the, the ability to to go to the pub or go and you know get face to face with people and have that you know lengthy conversations and spells hanging out with each other finding out what we, what we really think and getting to grips with these things because we live in this kind of clickbait uh, online society the majority of the time due to lockdowns do you think um coronavirus and lockdowns suit big tech down to the ground well it certainly seems that way i mean if you look at you know look at the the us stock market it, it's it's doing very well or has done over the lockdowns. But why is that? It's not because every company in the top 500 has done very well. No, it's six companies. It's Facebook, Google, Amazon, etc. So those are the businesses that are thriving out of this. And of course, you know, we're all stuck on social media, not being able to go out. It plays into that. Um, and, you know, it's not for me, the issue is not a Trump or a, a Biden right or left. It's just I don't want four people to be controlling every piece of information that we consume. And it's not just about censorship either, because it's also about shaping the direction of society. I mean, look at something like the BLM protests and riots that we had in London, right? The, the, the killing of George Floyd was terrible. What happened there was terrible. The United States does have a, a fraught racial history. We don't have that issue in anything like the same way in this country. Innocent black people aren't being gunned down by police in the street. Uh, in Britain at all. Uh, I think last year, uh, it was either one or two people of color were killed by the police in this country uh, when they were unarmed, one of whom was Usman Khan, the, the London Bridge terrorist, right? So this problem doesn't exist in this country. And yet, we had these mass protests and we had riots in this country over that. Now, ask yourself this, could that possibly have happened without social media? I really don't think it could have, no. So, I, and, and I think that's, that's the point that you're making, which is, and, and look, it's a double-edged sword. Of course, it's great that uh, with the emergence of social media, police brutality and corruption where it is happening uh, gets exposed. That, that is a very good thing. Uh, but I think the, the, the fact that things can go viral across the world, uh, it creates this experience that we, we sort of all live US politics now, you and I sitting here in the UK are discussing the US election because it has an impact on our lives. It's not because we're just because we're sort of junkies for politics and we're obsessed with it and we're interested in it. We know that what happens in America doesn't stay in America, right? Uh, what happens in America spreads around the world. And I think social media is a huge part of that. It's a huge part of, part of that. And it's, uh, I mean, it honestly is probably the, the main governing force over people's lives these days. I can't go to a restaurant or hang out with people without at least certain members of the group wanting to film stuff and put it on their Instagram all the time, or just they're constantly, you know, if they're a bit bored, if there's a lull in conversation, onto our phones we go. It's mm -hmm. a it's a bizarre uh, way that society's going, and and in many ways I think it's very sad. Even though, it, as you say, it does have its benefits in terms of it has massive benefits. And I don't want to be one of these sort of luddites about it. I, I I love being on Twitter. I I have an audience of people who are interested in what I have to say. We have conversations. We joke. We send each other memes. 
you know, we comment on, on, on events that are happening. I have a chance to sort of test my thoughts against the prevailing mood of the people that follow me people so it's great that the fact that i can you know uh francis my co-host and i we helped raise about 30 to thirty-five thousand pounds for uh eight fijian soldiers who served in the british army um and the the government denied their application for visas based on small clerical errors and stuff like that and in the space of about 72 hours just through Twitter and the fact that we have an audience, we helped raise about 30 to 35,000 pounds, taking them well on their way uh, to, to being able to remain in the country for which they fought. These are men who fought for this country in, in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And we can do that by typing some words into a phone. That's incredible. That is brilliant. That is a wonderful thing. Uh, but we have to recognize that social media also has some terrible, terrible impact on our societies. The division we now see in politics is a big part of that and i think going forward in the next decade we're going to have to work out how to mitigate some of the disastrous effects it's had while retaining the great things that that they have brought us yes it's going to be a huge challenge polarization is a huge problem in terms of well as we've seen in the us um, more than anywhere else mm. there's such passion uh, anti-trump passion and kind of make America great again, passion amongst those going to the, the rallies. Um, that whole MAGA movement is, is, is huge too, although you know it's slightly behind in the popular vote. Um, so I want to know what you think about how America might end up progressing with what's likely to happen. I mean, what seems most likely to happen is um, Trump losing and then contesting the election, are people going to lose a lot of faith in democracy um, over the coming weeks and months? And whoever's president, I mean, if it's Biden, you're just probably going to get um, the Republican Party starting again um, without having lost too much of an advantage um, in the Senate. Um, but you know, so they won't have lost out too badly from the election and they can just ditch Trump and, and start again. Um, but with what's likely to happen over the coming weeks, are the American public going to get really quite heated and even more polarised? Well, I'd like to say no to that, but I'm not sure that I can. I think uh, this really was the nightmare scenario that I've been worried about the whole time, which is that one side wins, it's very close, it gets contested, and fought over because yes this happened with gore versus bush uh w bush uh in 2000 but the country of the united states was not polarized then in the way that it is now uh, and i think that unless there's a very clear biden victory now which seems to be the only victory that would be clear you know the only way trump can win at this point is by and going to the supreme court uh, unless there's a very clear biden victory you're going to see a lot of infighting uh, and whoever ends up president is going to be hugely delegitimized. I mean, let's say that now Donald Trump manages to somehow get into uh, into the, uh, a re-election and, and remains president. If you think about all the criticisms that were made of him and all the things that were said about him for the last four years, well, that's going to take off in a stratospheric way. Uh, and equally with Joe Biden, there will be a very significant number of Trump fans who, no matter what happens, feel that they were cheated out uh, of a Democratic win for their guy. So it's it's a nightmare scenario. Um, as you say, the, the Republicans have managed to hold on to the Senate. And, and I think if Biden does win, what will happen is uh, for the next four years, the Democrats are likely to pursue uh, even more of the woke agenda than they already have. They will feel emboldened. Uh, they will not learn any lessons from what's happened uh, and the fact that they're blue wave and landslide didn't materialize they will think it's their one shot to implement even more radical policies they will do that they will continue to alienate more and more of the ordinary public and then in 2024 you're going to get someone like dan crenshaw uh, the 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 guy from texas former uh, u.s military veteran the guy with the eye patch i mean how badass would it be to have a president with an eye patch right uh, <laughs> so he will probably end up being the candidate uh, unless someone else emerges uh, and, and that would be a very strong platform because unlike Donald Trump, he's actually someone who could unite the country. 
Uh, and I suspect if Biden does win and if the Democrats do continue to go off the deep end on this, all this crazy woke stuff, you will see uh, a, a sort of uh, a much more uniting figure from the right uh, come in in 2024 and, and win and probably uh, go on to have a, a long, uh, a long uh, period in government. So you think that there's going to be a bigger reaction to the woke agenda than there is a kind of lasting impact from it? Well, yeah, because if you think about one of the reasons that people voted for Donald Trump, I mean, I think the first issue was number one issue was immigration. But the second issue was political correctness. That is what people said uh, in polling afterwards. So people are clearly concerned about the woke agenda. And if you imagine that for the last four years, uh, people felt that maybe the cultural institutions are becoming very woke, but at least they have a president who isn't. Well, what's going to happen now is uh, you're going to have a president from the left. I don't believe that Joe Biden is particularly woke himself, but he's not really going to have much to do with, with that. Uh, and it will happen behind his back. Uh, if they double down on the work agenda, then ordinary people are going to be more and more alienated from the Democratic Party. Uh, and you will see uh, a lot of people being pushed towards the right. And you've seen it in this election. I mean, we were told that Donald Trump is this racist, sexist, horrible bigot. He increased his vote share with every group except white men. Yeah. yeah. So, so th this notion that, you know, there was this great th thought on the left that, you know, all Democrats need to do is just let the demographic changes continue to happen in society. And if you can get enough Latinos and if you can get, and get enough black people uh, uh, into the country or, you know, to have more of them in the country, uh, then they will all belong to the Democrats. Well, you're starting to see that that isn't the case. Uh, and I'm glad about that because I'm personally uh, very, very tired of minorities being told which way they should vote based on the color of their skin or their gender or their sexual orientation. I don't think that uh, political parties own people from minority backgrounds like myself. I just think uh, we should be able to be able to free to choose who we want without being criticized for being traitors or whatever. And it really pisses me off. So I'm glad to see that. And I say that left and right. You know, I don't think uh, Cuban Americans belong to the Republican Party. And I don't think that, you know, black Americans belong to the Democratic Party. People should be free to choose who they vote for based on what they think, not the color of their skin. Yeah. And I think there should be more of a focus on making it less tribal. It shouldn't be we're with the woke tribe, which is the blue tribe, and we're with the sort of anti-woke. You know, it just seems so stupid. Um, and it does seem like, as as well as this, many so many people who vote voted Democrat feel like that's really the right thing to do. You get a lot of this. You know, Tom, sorry, can I interrupt you there? Yeah, sure. Uh, because you mentioned the tribal thing. I, I would maybe push back on some of what you said there in the sense that I don't believe that human beings are ever capable of not being tribal. The problem with the woke shit is that it encourages people to be tribal along racial, sexual and orientation lines. In other words, it reinforces the, the racial prejudices that all people already have it teaches people to be suspicious of people of other races. Now, in, in a multi-ethnic society like the ones that we have in the West, that is a recipe for disaster and it will lead us to very, very dark outcomes very, very quickly. Uh, but it, there's nothing, in my opinion, necessarily particularly wrong with people being tribal along political lines. You know, if you believe in small government and I believe that the government should take care of everything, uh, there's nothing wrong with us being opposed to each other and having that conversation. Uh, what what I think is very wrong and very bad is if, if you are taught that you must be suspicious of me because I have slightly darker skin than you and I should be suspicious of you uh, equally because you, you're white or you are male or whatever, those things are very toxic. Uh, but you're never going to stop people from being somewhat tribal. Yeah, well, I agree with you in the sense that it's tribalism along political lines is quite difficult to shake off if you, you know, believe in one form of government versus another. But this almost doesn't seem to be about that. Uh, most, of, most of the public figures, celebrities that one has heard saying why we should vote Democrat, it's been about because of the type of man that Joe Biden is, because he's a better person, because our ideology, um, this ideology of uh, kind of identity politics um, almost, 
um, is, is sort of morally superior, but the actual politics of it, um, their systems of, of governance, uh, for all their you know, potentially very honorable intentions, um, it's led to kind of quite an exodus of the same sort of people who are espousing these political values. Um, a lot of public figures are actually leaving places that are, are famously Democrat places. So you see, you've seen quite a few people move from California to Texas. Um, and, you know, due to the way that Los Angeles is ravaged by, by poverty in, in so many areas, and there's a, there's a huge problem of, of homeless people. Mm. Um, and, and it seems to me there's this quite disingenuous um, group of celebrities and public figures who push progressive ideology um, without actually, you know, how much do they believe in it? How, you know, how much do they believe in a socialist a, a, a agenda? I'm not saying that Joe Biden is a socialist because he's he's a moderate Democrat. Um, but some some of the um, some of the ideology that they're they're purporting to believe in, I'm pretty sure that they they don't. Well, a lot of people believe stuff in theory, but when you've got uh, an Antifa mob burning down your city, it becomes a little bit more difficult to hold on to those values uh, as that's happening. A lot of people are finding out the hard way the, the consequences of supporting those sorts of policies. I, I was speaking to a friend of mine in Portland the other day, uh, and he was saying basically that every middle class person I know is moving out of the city. And, and that's because you can believe what you believe, but you know the moment your house is being burned down by a mob or or a shop near you, or you've got violence in the streets and the police are standing down, now that that's going to make you think differently about these things. So yeah, I think a lot of people have been able to get away with the sort of virtue signaling, never really having to live with the consequences of the things that they advocate. Um, whereas those of us who have lived in socialist countries or grown up in socialist countries know uh, that. Uh, <laughs> It comes with a certain set of problems that you may not necessarily want to invite into your home. It's very interesting um, when, when you say, you know, those of us who've grown up in, in, in socialist countries. Did you grow up in a socialist country? Well, I'm, I was born in the Soviet Union uh, in the early 80s. So I spent just under 10 years living in the Soviet Union. And of course, if you, if you grow up in a country like that, it's not just your own experience. You speak to parents and grandparents and, and there's a legacy of what that's like that you are in it, genetically and sort of informationally in contact with. So yeah, I, I grew up in Russia, uh, it, it, what was then the Soviet Union, then I also spent a few years living in uh, early modern Russia. Uh, so I, I have a sense uh, that many people in the West unfortunately don't, uh, that the world isn't what you experience here in the West. The idea that you can change everything about the West and it will still be the way that it is, is absolutely absurd. Uh, most of the rest of the world is a very dark, violent, unpleasant place in which people really struggle and their lives are difficult and miserable. Uh, and that's why I've been very keen to push back against the sort of people who want to undermine Western society, Western values, Western history, who want to tell people in this country uh, and in America that your history is evil, you're evil, blah, 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 blah. I've been very keen to push back against that for the simple reason that I know where that leads. Uh, and I know that the West is the best thing that we've as humanity ever, ever produced. Does that mean it doesn't have problems? Of course not. We have very big problems in the West. Look at the housing crisis. Look at inequality. These are all problems that we're going to have to solve. But the truth is, in my opinion, that the West has created uh, some of the best societies in human history. Uh, and, and the attempt to destroy that from within, it troubles me tremendously. And that's why I've been so uh, forthright and pushing back against it. Incredibly interesting um, that, that you would have heard that kind of probably stories from from your relatives um about what it's like uh, under socialist government i mean it, of, of course despite all of trump's kind of pushing of this narrative that joe biden is uh, a puppet for a radical left socialist agenda i mean do you think that's true and and you know what do you think of joe biden as a character because we focused a little bit on um, Donald Trump, as as is inevitable, um, but I'm I'm interested. Um, in I mean, Joe it. Biden, as far as I'm concerned, is not a particularly important historical figure. He will be president, in my opinion, for a couple of years before he is forced to retire with health issues or or or, or else. Uh, 
so I, I don't see him as a particularly important figure. I don't think you're going to have some kind of Biden-based theory of international relations or Bidenomics or anything like that. I don't think he's going to dramatically change anything. But what you will see uh, is the new Democratic Party, the party that is obsessed with race, obsessed with gender and uses it to divide people. So I don't know that I believe that Joe Biden is this fourth bringer of harbinger of socialism. I don't I don't imagine that he is a socialist, but you have within the Democratic Party a very strong component of it that is pro-socialism. Uh, and people like AOC and the squad uh, and Bernie Sanders, who's, it's, not, it's not me saying this, so they say that they're socialists. They describe themselves as democratic socialists. These are people who genuinely want it. Now, what that looks like in the American context may be quite sort of moderate by Western European standards. We may think that what the Americans are terrified of is socialism uh, is actually kind of what we do in this country. That remains to be seen. But I don't think Joe Biden is a particularly significant historical figure. Uh, as I say, I think the party is what matters and what the party has become uh, it is uh, is something that does trouble me as someone who's genuinely a centrist. I'm not. Uh, I'm not on the right. I'm not on the left. I genuinely sit in the centre. Uh, and and that, again, people get very confused about th what what being a centrist means. A lot of people think that means that I don't have any strong opinions, but actually, it's quite the opposite. I have very strong opinions that fall both on the right and the left of the political spectrum, uh, depending on the issue. Uh, so, as someone who is in that position. What I see is that the Democratic Party has gone very, very far to the left, particularly on social and cultural issues. I think socialism is more of an economic thing and how far they've gone up to the left on that, I don't know. But on the cultural stuff, they have gone way, way, way off the deep end on that stuff. And um, yeah, I think, like I said, if, if they continue to push that, they will alienate more and more of the American public uh, and you will see a backlash against that. Uh, in 2024 that will make uh, the Trump's first election just a, a, a kind of uh, something that we will look back to and go, well, that sort of made sense. I think it's very important to distinguish between socialism in an economic sense and socialism in a cultural and, you know, society sense, societal sense. Um, kind of identity politics is, is one thing, but you know, I think the people who are dissatisfied with in, with injustice in America, the people who are marching, the people who are protesting, they don't really care probably a great deal about, you know, just saying that all people are issue and making a great big deal of people's race and making a great big deal of people's gender. They, they probably want things to change on an economic level. They don't want to be so poor. They want to have better jobs. They want to have better education. So this kind of socialism that that doesn't push doesn't change anything you know tangible material in in people's lives is that going to be something that lasts very long um and do you think joe biden can unite the country because i spoke to a guy who worked for him called mo vella um who worked for al gore as well and he he, he told me that joe biden was a consistent lover of humanity and he was the best person possible to, to unite the country. Um, do you think uh, he's got the ability to bring America together? Because that seemed to be the, the focus of his rhetoric in his recent speech. Well, it sounds like your, your previous guest was very fair and objective. <laughs> um, uh, can Joe Biden unite the country? I don't think so. I think he's certainly less of a divisive figure than Donald Trump. That's probably his greatest asset, that he is far less divisive. Uh, I don't, I don't see him as a figure that can unite the country. No, uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think the people who voted for Donald Trump will see Joe Biden as someone that they will get behind them. Some of them will. Uh, but the question for me is, can Joe Biden govern his own party? Can he lead his own party away from the extreme? That is the one question I think no one knows the answer to at the moment. And that is what remains to be seen. Can he drag his party back towards the center? If he can, then he stands a chance of uniting the country. If, if people see that a year or two down the line, uh, all that woke nonsense is sort of not really being advocated within the party, if maybe he slaps down a few extremists within his own party uh, or quietly tells them to shut up, that may be something that helps. But if he doesn't do that, uh, I don't believe he'll be able to unite the country behind him, partly just because he's not a particularly inspirational figure. Um, I think a, a sort of 
a right-leaning moderate like Dan Crenshaw or on the left, someone like, I mean, certainly in terms of policy, someone like Andrew Yang and Tulsi Gabbard, they're the sort of people that could unite the country. But I don't think we're in a time at the moment where people lo are looking for someone to unite the country. I think people are very divided now and they're looking for someone to represent their fairly extreme position. Uh, so I think it'll be a process. And I hope that by 2024, we can get to a position where people are finally, again, looking for someone who can bring people together. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be nice in some ways if, if people could adopt a more centrist um, view. Although, I mean, I suppose your point that centrist doesn't mean that you kind of have no opinion and sit on the fence. It just means you lean right and you lean left on different issues, more or less, and you know that all in all, you're, you sort of converge somewhere between the two. Uh, it's interesting about, about what we were saying earlier about big tech and, and, and mainstream media. There's been so much on, oh, the polls got it wrong and stuff like that. You know, I, I personally couldn't really care about, about polling. Um, I, well, I it's good because it is important. Uh, I mean, the, the thing with polls is they tell people what the prevailing mood is supposed to be. Yeah, and yeah. so if the polls two weeks out from an election are telling you that Donald Trump is going to lose very badly, if you're a Trump voter, that may have an impact on you voting or going to the polls or whatever. So I, I do think the polling industry needs to improve because otherwise, what is the point of polls if they consistently get things wrong? For example, I'll give you an even more crucial example to, related to something you and I were talking about earlier. It's very clear to me that the government in this country is basing a lot of its policies on what the public perception is according to the polls. So if the polls currently are saying that 70% of people support lockdown, the government feels very comfortable then in delivering lockdown. But if that is completely wrong, and in fact only 20% of people support lockdown, uh, or 30 or even 40%, then that changes the entire policy of our government, which seems to be following the public instead of leading. Uh, so uh, for that reason, I think polling is very important. And the and the fact that we've had a number of polling failures over the last uh, four years, I think is a big issue. Yeah, I mean, I suppose in that way, it really could, it can have an effect on, on democracy. Um, you know, I, I was mainly saying I don't care about it just because I'm so sick of hearing about it. So sick of hearing um, how triumphant people who are about to lose an election, i.e., you know, the Trump party, are in talking about, well, we beat the pollsters. I mean, who cares? You didn't beat Biden, did you? And equally, um, I'm bored of the pollsters getting it wrong. And I don't think that's going to change. I hope it does for the reason that you said that polls are important, which, you know, I, I would be inclined to agree with you on. Uh, in the same way that the polls are getting things wrong, to what extent do you think that I mean, I know you mentioned talk radio and, and on, I've noticed on YouTube, you know, like, for example, The Independent, um, a national newspaper, and, and, and I could pull up the statistics for other newspapers and it'd be, probably be, you know, similarly unimpressive. I mean, The Independent, I think, have fewer subscribers than Trigonometry on YouTube. Um, Doesn't surprise me because we're better. Uh, <laughs> no, but look, let, let's be honest, uh, let's be fair to them. They obviously, the, the newspaper itself, I imagine, does get read. Uh, widely i don't yeah. know uh but yeah i mean we were talking we just had a guest on from talk radio and they were they were talking about the they they this sort of numbers that they're looking at now are sort of in the in the range of a million listeners well trigonometry is approaching if you take youtube and our podcast into account about mm -hmm. two hundred thousand. so uh, two comedians uh after two and a half years uh are a fifth which isn't, doesn't sound like a lot, but but we're growing very quickly uh, of a major radio station with dozens of huge presenters with massive names. So, yeah, the, the the democratization of the media space, I think, is a very good thing. Certainly good for us, uh, and and we're happy to be involved in it. Uh, but uh, yeah, it does it does show you that if you put out content that people actually enjoy, uh, you can have a lot of success nowadays, which is which is one of the great things about the internet. Yeah, and 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 on that note. I was going to say, it, do you think that in the same way that I was saying that the comment, commentary about the, the polls could, could in a way be futile because it's unlikely to change unless it's radically overhauled, um, we, we almost don't need to worry too much about mainstream media getting things wrong because, I mean, do you think one of the benefits of, of tech 
um, provided censorship isn't too stringent or partisan, um, is that we're going to see people starting up um, series like yours, um, that there, there are all sorts of blogs out there, there are all sorts of YouTube channels out there. I mean, given the fact that the your viewership is larger than that of the independent, a fifth of talk radio, as you mentioned, and that, you know, I mean, you've probably got a, a, a healthy fraction of the, the, the subscribers that like Donald Trump has on, on YouTube, you know, the, and, and, and the, indeed, you know, Joe Rogan, like look at him, 10 million. I mean, there, there are all sorts of, of just completely independent, you know, Rogan might have, have this big name now, but it's just him and a, and a couple of people on his, on his immediate team, mm -hmm. um, which, which makes things very independent um, and, and kind of away from the partisan nature of mainstream media in a, in a way. No, I agree with you. It is exciting. And for people like us, that's obviously a great thing. Uh, it, it's, it's a huge advantage of the internet uh, for people like Francis and I, who are not particularly welcome in our own industry. Uh, it, certainly we were never going to be, uh, ex you know, rushed through the comedy industry all the way onto Mock the Week because uh, basically we have the wrong genitals, the wrong skin color, etc. That is the, the crudity with which it's done nowadays. Uh, but we've created something very special without that. And th that's a huge thing where you don't have to uh, find yourself, uh, you know, begging gatekeepers to give you an opportunity. Uh, you can just do it and you can do it yourself. Uh, having said that, I think the mainstream media are very important and I do hope they address uh, what they've been doing because, you know, if we have, uh, let's say, a doctor on our podcast talking about the fact that lockdown doesn't seem to make sense, that isn't given the same way as, as something on, a, on, on the BBC News or whatever. Uh, and so uh, I think it's important that the mainstream media continue to do their job. And I hope that what they're learning from the fact that people like us are having a lot of success is what they need to do to improve as well. Uh, because I, I do think we need a healthy media landscape too. Yeah. How, to what extent do you think the BBC, there are a lot of people sort of joining these defund the BBC groups and uh, there's quite a lot of contempt for the BBC and the way that they report and what people perceive to be their bias. Do you think that that's uh, a mountain being made out of a molehill? Do you think, in fact, that they're fairly balanced or do you think that there's something in this? Well, Personally, I combine two irreconcilable positions, which is I think the BBC is extremely biased and I simultaneously think the BBC is extremely important. Uh, I, I think the BBC has a vital role to play in bringing society back together. It just has not been playing that role for a number of years. Uh, I see on cultural issues, I don't know about politics and economics and party politics. I don't know that necessarily uh, the BBC is massively uh, you know, pro labor, let's say. I don't believe that. But on cultural issues, the BBC is incredibly woke. I know that having worked at the BBC, I've written for comedy shows on the BBC, I've worked uh, on, on a number of BBC programs. I know from the inside out uh, uh, that, you know, I've had, for example, I once appeared on the BBC program where I was invited as a sort of like token uh, anti woke guy. And the producer on that show was telling me that she has opinions on some issues that are aligned with mine, but if she expressed them at work, she'd be fired, right? So people at the BBC fear expressing their opinions, very reasonable mainstream opinions, uh, for fear of being fired. So I know from the inside that the BBC is biased on cultural issues, and I hope they change that because if they don't, they will get defunded, and I think that will be a huge loss. Yeah, I think it would be a huge loss as well. The BBC has been responsible for some incredible cultural moments and there have probably been eras of the BBC when I would have probably been too young to engage properly with what they were reporting on, but where their reporting was excellent. And there are probably still some great people working at the BBC now. A lot. So, so in terms of what you said there about the employees saying that they, you know, they would get fired for expressing these unwoke opinions um, as my final question about the US election um, do you think the phenomenon of the the, tr the shy Trump voter was was huge um, I know I said I was bored of polls but that is one element of, of it that is quite interesting that um, people can be was, was there someone fired for wearing a, a MAGA hat into work 
Um, or I, I don't know the case you're referring to, but that certainly wouldn't surprise me, no. I mean, isn't that quite odd, though? To, you know, this is a mainstream political figure. It's the president, and and to express support for him in the country where he's president is considered like a, a fireable offence. I, I, I know that, like, that. you know, if I got invited round to a certain group of friends to a dinner party, I mean, I'm not a Trump supporter, I'm not a Biden supporter, I've, I'm pretty much apolitical, and I've only recently actually got engaged at all in politics, being primarily a sort of music uh, lover. Uh, but I find them increasingly interesting. And I know that if I rocked up with a Make America Great Again cap to like a dinner party and said I love Donald Trump, you know, they'd just be like, leave immediately. Mm. So do you think we're too shy of uh, those people who who like Trump um, or, or indeed in this country, people who support Brexit or all of these issues? Yeah, I, I don't know that it's necessarily about those people being too shy. I think uh, we've allowed politics to become a religion. And so if you don't have the correct opinion, it's not about, you know, you disagreeing on politics. It becomes you being a heretic. Uh, and heretics have always been treated very badly. And I think that is the danger of making politics into a religion. We need to realize that politics is a lot less significant than we've made it. And, and the other point I would make here, this is where the importance of language comes in. If you spend four years telling people that uh, Donald Trump is literally Hitler, is literally a fascist, is literally a white supremacist, then and these are all lies, they're not, they're not true, uh, then what happens is anyone who's then seen to be supporting that is then essentially associated with Nazism, with white supremacy, etc. Uh, and this is why we have to stop being dishonest in labeling our opponents. I think uh, you could make the case that Donald Trump is obnoxious, you could make the case that he's dishonest, you could make the case that uh, he's said and done a lot of things that many people would disagree with. And I think that is a case that ought to be made. Uh, but to to, des to describe them as literally the worst thing that's ever happened is inaccurate. And the reason a lot of his supporters don't want to admit to being his supporters is that there's been a climate created where if you do support that, you're literally a Nazi and people aren't Nazis. Yeah, and it is hyperbole, uh, without a doubt, to, you know, extreme hyperbole to compare him to Hitler, which I've heard a number of times. Um, and indeed, you know, I've had people on the podcast who, who are so anti-Trump anti that they've said that he's a fascist uh, demagogue and, and things like that. Um, you know, I, I, I welcome everybody, everybody expressing their opinion, but at the same time, in the same way that you said, you know what it's like to, um, you know, to, to grow up in a, in a, in a socialist country, um, I think there are some people who probably know people, you know, knew people who suffered through World War II, um, and it's probably that you know they would probably find that a little bit disrespectful or or just a bit. Well, my Jewish uh, great grandfather died fighting Nazis on the Eastern Front, uh, and, and the idea that the people who 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 he was fighting were in any way connected to a modern political movement in the United States that doesn't do anything like they were doing. It's insulting. It's absolutely insulting. And the fact that people have been able to get away with that is a joke. Uh, and the fact that not enough people have challenged it is also a joke. And, and that's one of the things that I've resolved for myself going forward. People who smear or mislabel me, which, which I'm sure will happen, I'm going to start suing people because much as I believe in freedom of expression, I think it's important. I also think that the idea that you can just go around and slander people uh, without any basis in fact whatsoever and call them horrible, horrible names. Uh, it's not about offense. It's just about ruining people's reputation. And I think if more people stood up to that, uh, you would you would find that the people who have got into a habit of calling everybody a Nazi uh, will will stop doing it. And that's one of the things that I've resolved for myself. Yeah, I think it's important to challenge misinformation. And indeed that, you know, there are many people on the kind of work side of the equation who, who are passionate seemingly about fact checking. Uh, one, one final question on this note, actually, I saw this, um, this uh, pushback from a political commentator about wearing wearing a poppy and saying that that was a, a kind of um, inappropriate now because it was too political. Um, do you think as as the years roll on, do you think kind of what the world went through, what the Western world went through with 
World War II is going to be kind of consigned to the dustbin and or, or rather consigned to lots of re-evaluation where you know the Brits and and the Allies are kind of made out to be you know maybe not as bad as Hitler but just pretty bad and uh, and it's going to be kind of reframed. I don't think so. I think it's an issue that only exists on Twitter among these stupid woke people. The, the reality is most people love their country. They understand the history and the sacrifices that were made. Uh, I don't see that as, as ever going away. And I hope we continue to uh, commemorate and celebrate the lives of the people, the men and women who sacrificed their lives uh, to keep us free and to keep us safe uh, and to keep us living in the countries that we live in now, as opposed to being uh, in, in, in an actual Nazi country, which is where we would have ended up. Uh, I, I, I just, I don't think that that's where the country's at, to be honest. Well, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that because it can, it can be worrying um, when you see kind of movements like that, which seem just totally pointless, uh, gathering, gathering steam. Um, Thank you very much, Constantine, for joining me on the podcast. Uh, I, I feel like my mental faculties are, are not at their best, having stayed up uh, till you know seven thirty a.m. on election night. But mm -hmm. I really enjoyed talking to you, nonetheless. And my final question is: um, as this is the greatest music of all time podcast, I know that you're not a music fan, but do you listen to, to to music at all? Given kind of what I'm imagining is a very hectic schedule with trigonometry, and if so, you know what music do you listen to? Well, I listen to whatever our producer puts on. You really should get our producer on instead of me next time because uh, he every single time he puts something on, it's absolutely the right thing for my mood. Uh, but when I'm on my own, I tend to listen to a lot of 90s rap. Big fan of Ice Cube, Eminem, things like that. Uh, and also every now and again, I'll stick some trance on. Uh, so those are the, the sort of weird music choices that I have.